Thank you for having me here. Also great to meet, uh, do you go by Chaplain Joe? Pastor Joe? Um, and it get, get to see so many beloved profs. Um, already got ribbed by Glenn Kreider, so it's good to be back and be made fun of. Um, glad for that. Uh, also, you can thank Pastor Joe. Uh, you can thank Chaplain Bill or later unthank him for putting me in this spot. I came on the last day of Chaplain Bill's chaplaincy here just to hang out. We were good friends. And he said, hey, hey, come here. You're on my short list. I'm going to put you in. I'm setting the new guy up. Well, he may have set you up poorly. I don't know. <laughs> but I also want you guys to know that you need to thank me because there are two realities at DTS now that I single-handedly take credit for. One is, as Prof Kreider um, made fun of me not wearing a tie, when I was here in the Stone Ages, we had to wear a suit and tie. Okay? I was known as the non-tie guy because I would try to get away with not being in dress code as much. And so thanks to me, you're all in fleeces and like, <laughs> all right. So yeah, that, there you go, standing in basin. Secondly, I also want to take credit that you actually have a spring break now. You see, that happened because I got called into Chaplain Bill's office. Again, we were good friends, but I had violated the Missions Week chapel, chapel requirement policy. Said you had to be here for Missions Week. He called me in. He said, look, buddy, I'm supposed to do this. You didn't go to chapel. I said, Chaplain Bill, I, I, I go on a mission trip every summer. I'm in an ongoing mission. I was like, I get missions, but my ministry I lead was going snow skiing. So I chose snow skiing because if, if you guys would not give us a spring burp, it was two days back then, you give us a spring break, then I would be here for missions week. So again, you can thank me for spring break. <laughs> and I just wanted to say that. All right. Uh, Appreciate the introduction, um, Dr. Bailey. Buddy Lyles, who in the world is this guy? Uh, if you Google me, some of you could do that right now. If you Google me, what will come up first and for several pages is a man in his late 70s who sings baritone or bass, <laughs> touring the country still, singing Bill Gaither type gospel music. Uh, he's much more handsome than I. And I, I don't show up in a search result until page five. I did it. I Googled myself a few days ago. Not exactly a big name. A very, very few of you will ever, as a result of your ministry, be a page one of a Google search. Some of you will be a page three or a page five like me. Some of you may get depressed and never find yourself <laughs> on a search. Most of you will never be a big name pastor, author, conference speaker, blogger, or big name anything. But big, little, famous, or lesser known, let me assure you, there's a ministry that God calls you and he calls me to fulfill. He has a job for you. You may know what most of the job requires as we turn and you can open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Most of you are very familiar with this. It is um, on the DTS seal. It was our motto. I don't know if it's still our motto, preach the word. Um, and I don't know if that's the new model, or, but I like it also, teach truth and love well. But this is from Paul's second letter to Timothy. We know it's Paul's last letter. We know last words or lasting words. And it's really a, a job manual for ministry leadership, the entire book. And in a word, whatever your ministry would be, in a word, it should always come back to being a multiplier. Uh, put up this slide there for me. This is just a quick overview of 2 Timothy. Um, we went through it uh, not too long ago in our church. And if I had to sum up in one word, the ministry manual of ministry leadership from Paul to Timothy, it's multiplier, embody, entrust, and endure. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2, you know it, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's a multiplying effect, but it's first got to be embodied by you before you entrust it to others. But it does need to be entrusted also faithfully, but then you as the one who is trying to multiply what God's done in your life through the gospel and through him transforming you, there's also got to be an enduring quality, which Paul models. He can say at the end of his life, I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. And so many of us peter out. 
So many of us do not endure, and I would submit to you, it's partially because we don't understand something that our school motto, preach the word, I would add to it. Now I can get in trouble by saying I want to add to the school motto, but I want to show you why in this text. Here's what I'm going to do very simply. I want to take you through the job description, then something, uh, in fact, several of our staff team are here. They're the good looking folks in the back. And also my wife and my five-year-old Andrew are back there. But one of the things that each of them is they've gone through a process of being hired with Allen Bible Church. They've gone through, here's the job description, what we're looking for. But they also endure a second part from me, which I think everybody should do, which is why you don't want to take this job. So we're going to do Paul to Timothy. Here's the job. Here's why you don't want to take the job. There's certain hazards. And then we're going to actually ask two obvious questions but find there may be two not so obvious answers in terms of what God may want you to develop in and me to develop in so that we do embody and trust and endure the gospel. Look with me now at Paul's job description to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, here it is, preach the word, Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. This is his charge to heralds, which we'll talk about in a minute, to preachers. Now, there's a lot more, and many of us will not be those who are um, page one Google searched preachers. But all of us, whatever ministry we have, there's a certain communicating of God's word that will take place. And he's saying, here's the job to preach the word. First of all, notice that Timothy's charge is a supercharged one. Paul gives it an urgency and he intensifies it by those who are witnesses. He says, the presence of God the Father and Jesus the righteous judge. That intensifies, hey, Timothy, do you get this? Do you get who your supervisors are here in this job? But also by an imminent event, the prospects of Christ appearing in his coming kingdom in all its fullness. And then also by the personal example and anticipation of Paul himself who fulfilled his ministry. What's the, what's the job? Verse 2, preach the word. It is a sacred trust. A sacred trust, why? Well, the word preach there, we also know the noun form, is a herald. And a herald is one who proclaims publicly, makes known vocally and officially a matter of great importance and significance from the king or from the one in authority. And so it's a sacred trust. The herald is going out on behalf of someone else. It's not his message. It's God's message. And so it's a sacred trust. And he's going to bring a timely proclamation of that message. So not only do we need to know that the job is to be a herald, be one who vocalizes God's message to God's people, but also there's a timing of it. Look there again. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. What are the job hours in ministry leadership? It's ever ready. Now, if I was here on another occasion, I'd talk to you about boundaries and all that, okay? But just for now, understand that the job hours is an ever readiness. Timothy was to be a ready preacher no matter the season, convenient or inconvenient. And often, it's the least convenient times when God may use you the most. So be ready. Interestingly, that word contains concepts. Listen to this. When he says be ready to preach, contains concepts of both proximity and persisting. Proximity and persisting, a readiness. I am persisting and staying at the task. I'm standing my post. I'm standing at hand or close by with readiness. It's the fireman. The Mesquite Fire Department doesn't come put out a fire fire in Allen. The Allen Fire Department does. There's a proximity and there's a readiness. He says you got to be ready in season and out of season, whether you feel like it or not. And let me tell you, there's some days when I don't feel like it. There's some weeks or months or seasons when I don't feel like it. And again, not only does sometimes God do more in us when we're in that desperate place, but also he does a lot in us 
terms of that every readiness he wants to bring about. Then Paul describes three essential tasks. You've heard these before. To reprove, it means to correct or refute a falsehood, to convince, to supply proof or evidence of where truth has been diverted from. It's to replace someone's misimpressions with the truth. To rebuke, it means to chide, to tell a person to stop doing wrong. Um, Similarly, admonish is the idea of who's there to point out yellow flags. He says you got to be there to reprove, to rebuke, but also to exhort. It can't just be whack them with a stick. There's got to be an encouragement, an appeal toward noble, good living, alongside as an encouraging voice. As Dr. Curavilla said, and I came for all of his sessions, almost all of his sessions last year on preaching, to help them hear God's invitation to inhabit the truths of the text. But you have to help them. Sometimes it's a spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine to go down. So a herald is to preach the word with readiness. He's to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But I want us to notice how at the end of verse 2, that the herald, if you and I, whatever ministry you're in, how to preach the word. There's a tempering in how we preach. Look at the end of verse 2. He says to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Timothy's preaching, your preaching, your Tuesday night college ministry when you get up to give the message, your eighth grade boys talk when you finally get them to quit throwing things at each other. It's got to be done with great patience and instruction. With great patience literally means all long-temperedness, the utmost long-suffering, forbearance. That's an old word. It means you stick in there. You suffer through. But also instruction. He mentioned I coach. The instruction idea here is a painstaking teaching activity. Um, Last night, I painstakingly helped fourth graders learn to shoot layups using the square rather than thinking they're all Steph Curry from behind the three-point line. (laughs) And with great patience, I tease them about that they're not Steph Curry and that Steph Curry actually shoots a lot of layups before he gets out there. But it takes painstaking, painstaking teaching or coaching. He says that the two go together. It's not just preach the word. It's not just reprove rebuke and exhort, but it's how with great patience and instruction. There's proximity and there's persisting in embodying and entrusting God's word. This means that I don't just get up and give a solid sermon on a a godly biblical marriage from Ephesians 5. It also means that I show up on the porch of a man that I know and have known and was part of discipling him But now he finds himself in a place where he has shredded his marriage and he's threatening to leave it. And I just go and I just sit on the back porch. And I say, I know you don't want me to be here. Yeah, I don't. But you know I'm just going to stick around. Yeah, I know. And sometimes the great patience and the painstaking teaching is just sitting there in tears. He doesn't need my sermon on Ephesians 5. You see, to fulfill your ministry and the the preaching component is all we're looking at. There's so much more to it. But it takes preaching the word. It takes a pulpit, but it also takes a porch. It takes both. And now he gets to the part where he says, look, I, I think you want this job, Timothy, but let me... Let me try to talk you out of it, like I said I try to do. Why you don't want to take this job, it's because of the hearer hazards. Look at the climate and the people to whom he will preach God's word. He says, verse 3, For the time will come, and see if you hear your own, wherever you are ministering now, or your own self in it. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate or pile up for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And then I think this is so key. He says, but you, however, three different times in 2 Timothy 3 and 4. He says, regardless of that, you in contrast embody and entrust and endure. Live this way. He says, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. 
Here's why you don't want to take the job, Timothy. He forewarns him. Look, there's a time coming when the truth and God's heralds will be tuned out. They will stop up their ears and they'll seek out and solicit teachers who suit their own desires for that ear tickling. New stuff. They want to hear new stuff. They want to hear stuff that fits their lifestyles rather than be pointed out where maybe here's God's truth and here's your life. Help me understand how they don't align. He said the challenge, Timothy, is that hearers with ears tickled become increasingly teacher fickle. They become increasingly tuning out those who would preach. Itching ears is the idea that they have a strong desire to have one's personal prejudices and preferences affirmed, but it's also an unwillingness to hear anything that contradicts that agenda. The way I like to say it is they develop a hankering for heralds who tickle their ears, feed their fancies. And then, you know, if you think about it, as hearers, we want heralds for our hankerings. Those things that I really want, I want somebody to pronounce that to endorse that or to let that slide. He says that's the kind of climate. That's the kind of conditions. Those are the challenges, the hearer hazards you're going to endure. We do want a herald for our hankerings. We think about it. I, I mentioned if you Google search me, you're not going to find me till page five. Maybe if y'all all do it, I'll boost up to like page two. I don't know. <laughs> our staff can tell you I don't know a thing about technology, so I, don't, I have no idea. But... Think about in our culture, we have a hankering big time for big time names. We have a hankering for heralds with notoriety. Um, my wife wondered if I'd share this story. I'm going to share it very fast. Uh, my wife is a very reserved, godly woman. Um, sh and she, uh, she was at the playground one day with one of our kids. And there was another young woman there with her kid. And, and I think that this woman was maybe even going to look to figure out how to share Christ with my wife. Okay, great. Um, not knowing who she was. Well, the irony that she didn't know who she was is she had gone to our church for a little time. Okay. And if you've ministered in this area at all, a little time is very often for people. And she hadn't been there that much. And then also my wife so faithfully serves in the nursery. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily know who she is until I, I wring her arm and get her to sing Oh Holy Night and everybody cries on Christmas Eve and it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> but she's at the playground and this other lady's talking to her and she goes, she didn't recognize Day, and she's talking to her, and, oh, where do you go to church? Trying to ask Day. She goes, oh, I go to Allen Bible Church. She didn't say, I'm the wife of the pastor or anything like that. She goes, oh, yeah, we went there for a little while, but we go over, and she named Mega Church, okay? And then she said this, yeah, you know, we've just always been blessed with big name pastors. Now, she's lucky she said that to my wife because <laughs> of the godly restraint that she has. Okay? But we laugh at that. We can even almost kind of sit back and go, man, what an attitude. But how much is that really? Who speaks at our conferences? You know, Chaplain Bill just slipped me in here, right? I'm not a big name. And there's a lot, there's a lot of backing to it. To have a big name is not wrong. But, but as hearers, notice that we have a hankering for those with notoriety. Or also we hanker for novelty. Can you just tell me something new? He says they don't endure sound doctrine. Why? Because frankly, I'm bored. Frankly, I want you to amuse me today. Frankly, I want you to entertain me today. And he says, Timothy, you just got to endure. You've got to have an enduring patience with those who don't endure sound doctrine. It's just the way it is. When it comes to doctrine, I'll just say this. Beware when novelty begins to trump doctrinal purity for you. Mm. Now I got to move on. The harsh reality is that many hearers will actively stop their ears They'll tune out the truth. They'll turn aside the myths. But now there's going to be two questions that I want to ask. They're obvious from the text. There's a job description, the job hazards, why you don't want to take it. But now the two questions to ask as God seeks to develop you to fulfill whatever your ministry is, it's going to involve communicating God's word. It may not look like this, but whatever it will look like, there are two questions to ask that I think are obvious in this text. And the first question is this, what kind of hearer are you? 
See, we're all thinking of it right now from what kind of herald would I be? What kind of ministry leader would I be? What kind of communicator of God's word would I be? But it starts with what kind of hearer are you? Because the kind of hearer you are will determine, in a lot of ways, shape the kind of herald you are. So what kind of hearer are you? What's your endurance level for hearing sound doctrine? For listening to someone that you may never have heard of? To receive God's truth so that it also finds its way into being embodied in your life? What kind of hearer are you? I would say first and foremost, develop as a hearer first. Rooted within a body. This is written by Paul to Timothy while he was pastoring at Ephesus. Develop as a hearer rooted within a local body under local elder authority where the whole counsel of God is proclaimed and taught and forged out relationally with a few people over a long period of time. And I would say to you, be somewhere long enough, not just to fill out the requirements so you can graduate here, which I know from my day there were some guys that that was their case. It was hard for them to get that little piece of paper. Why? Because they weren't really rooted anywhere as a hearer. They weren't under authority. They weren't in the mess. Be somewhere long enough where others have to be patient with you. Where they have to give you timely, painstaking instruction. And resist the temptation to bail. Be very slow to bolt a place. Stay a little longer. Um, While I was here, they not only did... Can you thank me for spring break? Uh, We were some of the first spiritual formation groups. They're probably better now because of all that we went through to get them where they are. Okay? They were great. We loved it. We had an awesome group. Okay? But there was one guy in our group who was convinced he was going to be a herald. And he wasn't just going to be a herald. He was going to be a world-class heralder. In fact, he was going to graduate early because there was a big-time pulpit already waiting for him. We're like, man, you, you need to get involved in a local church here. No, no, I'm good, man. He graduated in three years. I think he graduated straight A's. He went back home. Didn't quite pan out that way. He ended up being the assistant manager at his dad's car wash. Now, that's a noble calling, if that's your calling. But why did he end up there? I would submit to you is because he never, he never developed as a hearer. He never rooted himself in a local body where things got messy. He thought, I'll just come and preach the word. But he didn't get involved where it needed to involve great patience. Patience for others with him and vice versa. Secondly, in terms of what kind of hearer are you, develop the ears to be easily edified. I want to share this story from another guy you haven't heard of, my friend Cole Huffman. He pastors First Evangelical Church in Memphis where I grew up. And he shared not too long ago about a hearing check that the Lord was doing on him. And I just want you to listen as he shares and reflects on his own heart of hearing story. And then he relates a story about Billy Graham. He said, a few months back, I attended a speech in which the the speaker said, pitching as, as if no one had ever heard this, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. He said, and then a guy seated next to me clicked his pen and he wrote it down, mm, mm, grunting and nodding in agreement. He said, well, I was done with the speech at that moment. I tuned out the speaker for the rest of the time. How dare that speaker offer such a tired old cliche without so much as a hint of rhetorical embarrassment. And then what it, and I appreciate what my friend says. He says, my response to that speaker reveals how much I still lack formation in Christ's fullness. Then he relates a story. He calls it a fragrant story about Billy Graham that impacted him deeply. He said on a visit uh, to London years back when Billy Graham was around 70, that he phoned All Souls Church where his friend John Stott had pastored. And he wasn't gonna, Stott wasn't going to be there, but Graham was going to come anyway. Well, the scheduled speaker for that day evidently was a young associate on staff. And then the other staff mercilessly told that young man, Billy Graham's going to be here listening to you. <laughs> Billy Graham not only listened to the nervous man's message, he took copious notes. By the way, the message was on singleness. More than that, back in the States, a couple weeks later, Billy Graham phoned the church again to ask if he might receive a recording of the Greenhorn's message. Yes, the one on singleness, as it had edified him. He wanted to hear it again. Hearing that story caused my friend Cole to examine his own resistance to hear. 
and how quickly we can all begin to deduct style points from those we might not deem worthy of our listening ears, thinking that the mature require a certain level of speaker, when the reality is those who are maturing are easily edified. Ask God to develop you into a hearer who is easily edified. And lastly, the last question, it's not just what kind of hearer are you, but what kind of herald does God call you and me to be? In a phrase, I would say he calls us to be vocal and local. We, get, we understand, y'all, y'all knew before I came in here, you have, some of you have memorized in Greek, preach the word, we got the vocal part. And we got to work on that, but we know, we understand that. But here's what I want to submit to you. For a preaching ministry and a pastoral ministry and ministry leadership to be effective, it's going to be when preachers develop staying power. A stamina to stay in the gospel. It says preach the word, but also stay engaged with the local body. What I want to invite you to do is to develop the stamina to not easily leave See, I was mentioning it earlier, our culture is a, a culture of church hopping. We've, we've felt that a lot in the last two years in our church. You know, the novelty wore off, the shine wore off, and whoop, there's a whole exodus of folks. We had some new folks come in, you know, right? And we can get on our congregations for being, they just church hop, and they do. But I want to start with us. It's not just the hearers who need to develop a stamina to stay It's you and me, not seeing where we are as lesser than, as a stepping stone, as, well, I'm just biding my time until I get here, but develop a stamina to stay, to not easily leave. The reason why I say this from this passage is he says, not just preach the word, but do it with great patience. That requires time. That requires mess. That requires going through what Paul says in Galatians, like, you guys are like, I'm going through childbirth here. And as I was preparing for this message some time ago, I thought about this and I pass it on to you. Do you realize your favorite podcasted preacher, he doesn't have to be patient with you. And what God says for me to be a healthy and growing and maturing believer, one who's easily edified, means I need to be close enough in proximity and around long enough where they have to be patient with me. Do you have that? As I told you, my friend didn't have that. And he went back and ran a car wash. I pray that God has done a great work in that. I'm not here to slam him. Uh, Desert Father Abba Anthony, I may be in trouble for quoting him. I just thought it was a great quote. I don't know anything about him. He may have awful theology. Here you go. (laughs) It says, someone asked him, "What, what, what must one do to please God? He said these three things. Always be aware of God's presence. Always obey God's word. And wherever you find yourself, do not easily leave. I'm saying that to you preachers. I'm saying that to you ministry leaders. Because we may be worse than those who church hop. God's call is for vocalized sound doctrine through localized heralds who must exercise patience and not easily leave. But that means we got to develop a long rhythm in a local place, as Zach Aswine has said. Howard Hendricks said this, and y'all already know this, and I'm about to add a second thing. It's also, you know, you don't add to the motto, don't add to Howard Hendricks, but I'm about to try. (laughs) He says, you can impress people from a distance. You can only impact them up close. Impact requires contact. And I would add this. And contact requires will require your patience. And patience is only required when you stay. Develop the stamina to stay. Ask God to make you a hearer who's easily edified and a preacher who does not easily leave. And what difference does it make? What if you're not a page one Google person? What if you're not famous? The call here is to not be, it's not to be famous or not famous. It's to be faithful to the job, knowing its hazards, and asking God to develop us with ears and also a stamina to stay. What I would say to you is, what difference does it make? What if you're tucked away in that little college ministry? 
What if you're tucked away and no one ever sees you? I'm standing on this podium because a DTS grad taught a boring hermeneutics class in a liberal Presbyterian church in Memphis, Tennessee. And my jock dad, who almost never opened a book until this time, began to, God began to open his eyes and he began to read the word for himself. And as he read it, he was a deacon in this church and he realized, I'm not a Christian. And he went to the preacher, the pastor and the, the elders there. And within two weeks, that class was shut down. And sometime around the same time, I became a Christian. And my dad and I grew up in the Lord together. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't be here right now apart from somebody not being famous, but communicating God's word with great patience and painstakingness in a little known back room of a liberal church. And through that localized herald, vocalizing God's truth, he got a hold of my dad's heart. And the, one of the greatest gifts of my life is to have watched him, watch the Lord grow him and transform him. And so I just say that to you because 99.5% of you will not be well known. You'll be a page 27 on the Google search. You'll be in a back room somewhere. But don't you ever think that God won't use you. Let's pray.